to you a little while um, from my heart today um, from there. Um, if you have a Bible, if you would open it to Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians, the very last chapter, chapter 13, 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 14. Second Corinthians thirteen and fourteen. It's a it's a it's a, a a short verse, but it it sums up, I think, what we're going to need to go into what God is doing in this season. And it says, "The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with you all." The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's pray. Lord, today, let your voice be amplified. Let your anointing be poured out. Brood over us even as you did in the genesis of things. Speak your word and birth your purposes and plans. Use us um, as instruments in your hand to bring in the harvest um, that you love so much. Lord, I invite you to think through my thoughts and just speak through my words. Um, Lord, let there be no flesh, just you. What we pray in Jesus' name, amen. First, let me say, it's good to see Apostle Yoder here this morning. Praise God. Amen. Glad she's here. Not that I don't, you know, I'm not glad to see all y'all. Oh, and my, my daughter-in-law is here too. Praise God. And my baby, my new baby, my Corey baby. That's baby number three. Praise God. Amen. So I'm excited um, for them to be here today. Um, I have really been, I was, I've just been in a, in a, in a different place, you know, I've been praying for a while, um, just asking God to do something, you know, in my heart and in my life. And um, um, I had to minister Friday night, it was their School of the Holy Spirit, so Friday night was supposed to be a, an, like an introduction to the Holy Spirit. And I'm just feeling like, Lord, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, um, be you know, so theologically sound, but no presence, you know. Um, so I've just kind of been in a, a different place. I've been taking a class um, with a young man that um, has really been blessing me in this season and uh, on learning how to enjoy the presence of the Lord. You know, I hope you never get to the point where you think you have arrived in God. You know, there's always more, praise God. So how do I begin to convey to you the hunger in my heart to know Holy Spirit? Um, I've been praying for more of him. I've been um, praying for a deeper intimacy. Um, I've been praying for that place where I know him even as I am known. I've been pressing in and praying for the Lord to awaken passion within me, to teach my heart to love him more. I mean, really love him with all of my heart and all of my soul and all of my mind and all of my strength. I want to know him. I want to see his face. I don't know about you. But I want to be held by him. I want to hear his voice. I want to be immersed into the depths of his glory and his love. And so I've been praying and asking him to change, to change my heart, to give me his heart, to give me his eyes and his hands, his words in my mouth, his compassion flowing through me. I want to really walk in his footsteps. I mean, I want to, for real, you know, for real, I want to enter the bridal chamber 
and be utterly consumed by him. My heart has been crying out for him, for Jesus, for the one thing, for the one thing that matters above every other thing. I've been crying out for a deeper encounter with Jesus and him alone. So I've been asking him to give me his heart and to take everything out of me that would dare take his place on the throne of my life. Ungodly ambitions, frustrations, distractions, idolatry, apathy, complacency, sin issues. You know, sometimes we like to think, you know, as believers, and particularly I'll talk to us because it's us, you know, particularly, you know, like apostolic and prophetic, charismatic, you know, the deep Christians, you know, the really deep Christians. You know, we like to think that, you know, we've overcome everything, you know, that it's the other people that, that need God to do something in them, you know. But I've been asking the Lord to really deal with me, to deal with my heart, to deal with anything in me that's, that's not like him, sin issues. Because all of those things, all of those distractions, all of them are rooted in, in, in sin issues. And, and they are the soul's attempt to find fulfillment in places other than at the feet of Jesus. And so the Lord has been teaching me that the answer to those problems, the answer to the the problem of sin, the answer to a soul reaching out for satisfaction is really him. His presence, his spirit, Holy Spirit, fellowship with Holy Spirit. John Piper in um, one of his writings said it like this. He said, sin is what we do when we are not satisfied with God. And so what we need is him. What the world needs is him. What government and political structures need is him. What the church needs is him, Jesus. A life surrendered to Christ in us and Christ with us. Um, so in response to my prayers and, and my coming before him and, you know, just sharing the yearnings, you know, of my heart in this season, he, he has been whispering, come, you know, come, you know, come, come to me, come and sit with me, just come and sit with me, come when I call. When I draw you by my spirit, come. And the Lord has been teaching me that what I'm really asking for, what I really need and what you need, whether you know it or not, is fellowship with Holy Spirit. Unbridled intimacy with Holy Spirit. A heart abandoned to a lifestyle of worship of him. A soul that burns for his presence. His spirit. Holy Spirit is his presence. And in his presence is the fullness of joy. Psalm 16 and verse 11. I've been thinking about it, you know. This is the purpose of the incarnation. This is the purpose of the birth and the life and the ministry and the death and the resurrection of Christ. This is the purpose of Pentecost. This is the purpose of Rosh Hashanah. This is the purpose of Yom Kippur atonement. This is the purpose of the Feast of Tabernacles, that we would be a people filled with and led by and intimate with and surrendered and yielded to Holy Spirit Christ in us, Christ resting upon us, Christ pouring his life and his love and his power out through us, out to others, out to the harvest for the salvation and the healing and the deliverance for the restoration of souls in him. This is the heart of the gospel. This is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. The Lord offers himself to us through Holy Spirit and we in turn offer him to others through the power of the Holy Spirit. So the church today should be a house of prayer. It should be a 
sacred, secret place, a bridal chamber, a wedding feast, a place that has given itself over to abiding in him and he in us to hosting his presence. Everything else, everything else, the signs, the wonders, the encounters, the miracles, the breakthrough, the deliverance, the healing, the provision, everything, everything flows from there. Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost to keep the post-Pentecost church seated with Christ in heavenly places, abiding in him and he in us. Why? So that we might become so transformed by the glory of his presence that we might be image bearers, distributors of his grace and his mercy and his power just as it is in heaven, let it be on the earth. And so Jesus said in John 15 and verse 4, He said, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. He said, I am the the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. That word abide is the Greek word meno. It means to stay in a given place, in, in relation or expectancy to remain. It means to continue to be present. It means to be held, to be kept continually, to remain as one. So abiding is intimacy. Did you know that there is a difference between holding hands and intimacy? There's a difference between holding hands and communion, intimacy, intercourse. There's a difference. You can't get pregnant holding hands. Pregnancy, conception, is the result of intimate communion. And that intimate communion, that conception, that gestation, that pregnancy, eventually pregnancy will bear fruit. You can't hide pregnancy. Eventually it will show and the fruit will be the result of the intimacy and the conception and the gestation and the coming and the coming and the keeping. And eventually that thing will get so big that it will bear fruit. And the problem, the problem in the church is that many believers will settle for artificial insemination. A quick, a quick impartation. Because real intimacy with Holy Spirit, real intimacy requires time. It requires the giving of time and total self. Real intimacy requires vulnerability. It requires surrender. It requires nakedness before him. It requires a saying, yes. It requires worship and and prayer, abiding, being held, staying. When When a person 
when a spirit, a person, settles for artificial insemination, their focus is just on the fruit. They're not interested in the experience of God. They're just interested in the fruit. And yet the Lord is looking for a bride and not a surrogate for the sake of productivity. You know, maybe, maybe that was just for me, you know? You know, this, is, uh, this has been a very interesting season, you know, and time, you know, in my life, you know, my birthday was this month and and you know when you when you reach certain ages you know you just begin to to reflect to reflect on where you are and what you've done and, you know and so turn and see you know having your 60th birthday you know you you start looking you realize you've probably lived longer than you've got left and so you begin to think about things you know and and what have you done? What, what have you done? Have, has there been any real fruit, you know? And I've been, I've been, you know, pressing into God. I'm like, Lord, you know, I don't want to live this long and, and not really know you, you know. I mean, what if I, I want to fall in love with you. I want, I want to know you. And the Lord has just been showing me some things. I, I brought my journal. I wanted to share with you just something the Lord said to me. I know you guys are radically saved, so you don't have these issues, but, but I, had a, I had a dream, and, and um, uh, oftentimes when I dream about my mother, you know, mothers are a picture of the Holy Spirit, and I had a dream about my mother, and, and my mother was laying in her bed, and I, I, um, I, wanted, I went in to hug her, and the implication was that there had been other people around as well, you know, but they were all, they had all left, they were gone. And, and I had my mother, I had my mama all to myself, you know, and I, I just wanted to be with her. And I had finished my work and I was going to spend time with her before driving home. And the, the dream implied that there was about an 8 to 12 hour drive, you know, before I got home. And it was late and I, I, I hadn't finished packing and I, and I wasn't quite ready to leave yet. But I wanted to just spend that evening just laying right up under my mama, which I used to do in real life. You know, I'd go get in her bed, you know, and she kind of had this spot, you know, where you lay all the time. So your body kind of makes an indentation in the mattress. And when she wasn't in the mattress in real real life if she was in a room, I'd just go lay in her spot, you know. And so in the dream, I, I, I wanted to just snuggle up under, you know, my mother. But when I went in, you know, and tried to get close to her, I, I felt like she wasn't happy with me. Like she was just not, she just wasn't happy with me. And, and, and so I was feeling neglected. And, and so I woke up. And when I woke up, the Lord began to press into the Lord. He said, he said, this is your perception of me. He said it's a works-oriented perception instead of love-based. He said, you think my pleasure with you is based on performance instead of a love-based relationship that delights in your presence. And you need a paradigm shift. And he said, so you need to keep coming, see, because he's not looking for a surrogate for the sake of productivity. He's looking for a bride, not artificial insemination, but real intimacy. And if all we want is the fruit and not the relationship, then we will become frustrated when the results, when the baby doesn't look like what we expected. I'm reminded of the story of Hannah found in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And Hannah, remember, was married to a man named El Elkanah. But, you know, see, the, the challenge in that marriage was Elkanah had another wife. And her name was Penina. And Penina was a baby-making machine. You know, while the scripture says that Hannah's womb was closed, and here's what's interesting about the text in 1 Samuel 1, verse 6. 
It says that Hannah's rival calls her a rival. That word in the Hebrew is tsara. It means an adversary. It means um, tribulation and trouble. And so Penina was um, Hannah's trouble. You know, she, she would provoke her bitterly. The scripture says just to irritate her. Penina would provoke her just to, be, to, to irritate her. But here's the thing that's interesting in the text. The Bible says that the Lord had closed Hannah's womb. Now, maybe that's why that door is still shut, you know. Maybe that's why you haven't quite been able to shift. Maybe the Lord is trying to tell you something. And so Hannah is greatly distressed. And so listen, listen, where's the point of irritation in your life? What thing, what issue, what person, what longing, what provokes you? What provokes you? What irritates you? What distresses your soul? Where's the tribulation in your situation? What longing aggravates and inflames you? In verse 8 of 1 Samuel, Elkanah comes and he says to Hannah, why do you weep? Why is your heart so sad? Am I not more to you than 10 sons? Hear the spirit of the Lord say to you today, why are you sad? Why are you diseased? Why do you weep regardless of your circumstances? Why are you discontent? Why are you dissatisfied? Am I not enough? Am I not more to you than you fill in the blank? Can't you find contentment in me? In my presence, am I not enough? Why are you looking for more? Do you love me? Are you in love with me? Am I not enough? A few minutes earlier, I said um, John Piper, I was quoting John Piper. He said, sin is what we do when we're not satisfied with God. When loving him is not enough, we cry out for and we reach for other things, things that will never satisfy your heart the way that intimacy with him will. So Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church so that you and I could be a God. A God. It's a Hebrew word, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Echad, hear, O Israel, the Lord is God. The Lord is one. Echad, a unity, one, one. So the Holy Spirit was poured out so that we would be Echad, one with God through Christ. Come on, that's the, that's the purpose of the gospel. Holy Spirit keeps the post-Pentecost church seated in the love seat with Christ in heavenly places, abiding in him and him with us and he in us and us in him. Why? So that just as it is in heaven, it would be on the earth. That's why the church today needs a course on love. A course on Holy Spirit intimacy and passion for Christ. A course on enjoying his presence. A course on falling in love with Jesus. Because everything begins. Everything else flows from there. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first its righteousness. And everything else flows from there. Jesus said, disciples are known as mine by their love. In John 13 and verse 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples by how long you can pray in other tongues and, you know, you know how, how, how beautiful your voice is or how, you know, you know in depth you can go into the, you know, the exegesis of the word. 
No, it says, they'll know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And this love must be cultivated in the secret place, the bridal chamber, that place of worship and stillness and prayer, that place where we feast upon the word of God, both logos and rhema, where discipleship is cultivated, sitting at his feet, beholding him, seeing him, remaining in him and with him, hearing him, longing for nothing else other than him. And then as he leads, do whatever he says to do. If we look again at 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ carries, the carries, the, the grace, the carries, the, the divine influence of God upon the heart. Carries. It's it's. It's reflection, the, the grace and the, the influence of, of God upon your heart and it's reflection in your life. That's grace. It means caris. It means the pleasure. It means the sweetness, the delight that were caris. It means the loveliness, the loving kindness, that which affords joy, the grace, the divine influence and affection, the sweetness, the pleasure of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if that's not enough, the love of God, the agape love, the, the dear love, the covenant love. And if that were not enough, add to that the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, koinonia in the Greek. That word means intercourse, communion, Intimacy, communication, partnership, the divine influence upon your heart that births sweetness and pleasure. You know, the covenant love, the communion, the intimacy of Holy Spirit be with you all. I've been reading a book um, by Eric Gilmore called The School of His Presence. And in it, he posed this question. If I was to ask you what God is after in your life, what would you say? What does God want from you? Many people would think that about the question and they would say, well, God wants obedience. God wants faith. God wants worship. God wants a deeper prayer life. You know, we would say something along those lines. And all of those responses are good. They're good. But I want to tell you today that God has a more specific yearning in his heart. The Lord has a burning desire to reproduce his image through the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. The Father's joyful objective is to transform us into the image of his Son. Every problem in human life can be traced back to one area or another in us, in our lives, in our families, in our culture, our government, our churches. Every problem can be traced back to um, something in us that has not yielded itself, has not submitted to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, intimate communion, where every problem, every issue can be traced back to that. In Romans 8 and verse 29, Paul writes, he predestined us to be conformed to the image, fashioned like unto his son. So the heart of God, the depth of God's desire is clearly explained as transforming you and I, molding and shaping us into the image of his son. Jesus is meant to be the firstborn among many brethren. In Hebrews, you know, we tease my daughter-in-law, you know, my babies that I love so much. 
And, you know, we keep saying, boy, you, you and Jerry keep having the same baby over and over and over. Over and over, the same baby. You know, they all look like, they look like siblings. They look like they're related, you know. They have subtle differences, but they look alike, you know. Come on, that, that, that's what God is trying to do in us. Jesus is to be the firstborn among many brethren. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10, the writer states that God is bringing many sons to glory. What does it mean? What does the image of his son in us mean? Here's what it means. It means that Christ's very person, his heart, his mind, his will, his mercy, his forgiveness, his power, his presence is unobstructed, unhindered while living through us. I'm going to say that again. What does it mean when the scripture says he's bringing many sons to to glory, transforming us into his image? It means that Christ's very image, his heart, his mind, his will, his mercy, his forgiveness, his power, his presence, his, his compassion, his love is unobstructed. It is unhindered while living through us. Another scripture picks up the same language and tells us how, here we go, how God is going to accomplish this in our lives. Don't you want to know? I mean, I want to know. How is God going to do this? And 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18 says, And we all with unveiled face behold him as in a mirror of the glory of the Lord. You know, let me start. I don't want to rush through that. I was reading this and I was thinking, how many times have I read that and not seen it? And not seen it. You know, I live in Dearborn Heights. So I live in a community where I'm I'm surrounded by people from the Middle East. You know, many of the women wear, I think it's called a hijab. They wear their heads covered. They wear their face covered. And this, this jumped at me all of a sudden. That woman whose face is veiled will only unveil it for her bridegroom or her husband in places of intimacy with him. And we all, with unveiled faces. That implies that you are in the bridal chamber. You are in a place of communion with your groom. And we all with unveiled faces beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. If I'm, if I'm beholding as in a mirror, that means that I've been unveiled and I've been with him so much that we're starting to look alike. I'm, that I'm looking as in a mirror that he looks like, I look like him and he, you know, I look like him. Let's leave it there. Praise God. And we all with unveiled faces beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed formed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And this comes from the Lord who is the spirit. And so the principle is clear that the image of Jesus in us and through us or the person and presence of Christ united with our being is the result, it's the byproduct of beholding him with unveiled face. That's intimacy. It's the result of gazing upon the ever-increasing manifestation of God who is the Lord Jesus Christ experienced through intimate communion with Holy Spirit. It makes me think about, um, oh man, her name went right out of my head. Um, Oh, she's the lady who wore the long gowns. She would come out, Catherine Coleman. And she would say, Holy Spirit is here. The whole atmosphere would shift. How do we do this? How do we practically apply this in our everyday lives? Here's what we do. Get still. That's the first thing. Just get still. 
Create a sacred space in your home, in your life, and get still. It could be your car. It could be a closet, the basement, the bathroom, particularly if you have little people that follow you everywhere. Some place you can go and get still. And listen, let me say this for all my, my young, you know, and it doesn't, it's not necessarily young because when you, when you have people that live in the house with you, how do you say, how do, how do I get still? Listen, there's a difference between quietness and stillness. Quietness is the absence of external noise, but stillness is the absence of internal noise. And it is the platform for adoration. So you and I, listen, this is what I'm trying to learn, how to carry that stillness no matter where I am. It's the platform of adoration, stillness. Because you can be in a place, you know, I remember learning that back in the day when we would do all that prophetic ministry. You'd have prophetic teams lined up all around the room and people, you got all of this prophetic, and it's noise, there's noise. There's not quietness. But in order to, to, to grab that word that's going to break somebody through, you have to learn how to enter into stillness. Even in an atmosphere where there may be noise. So the first step is stillness. Stillness is the absence of internal noise, and it is the platform for adoration. So our beloved whispers, come, come to me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, come to me. Bring all the noise. Bring all the issues. Bring all the thoughts. Bring them to me and lay them at my feet. Come, laying aside the internal chatter, giving your hearts to me in stillness. Come. And then the second thing, then we begin to adore him. Giving him your full attention and affection. The noise tries to break in, but you adore him. Just call it Jesus. You, uh, Jesus, Lord, I love you. Lord, I worship you. Just, just begin to, it'll drive those other things out. Many people go into prayer and they never touch the heart of God because they don't enter into adoration. Our spiritual senses are numbed, deafened in the prayer closet by all the pressures we put on ourselves to accomplish something. And our impulse to accomplish something stems from our desire for something other than just him. But listen, I want to tell you, if you get still and begin to adore him, you can work less and accomplish more. Yeah, so we get still, we adore him, and then we linger. When we are tempted to leave, we linger, oh, for just a little while longer. When the rush of the day and the tyranny of the urgent reaches in to pull you out, wrestling you from his embrace, say, no, no, just, just one more minute, just, just one more minute. And we re-enter stillness and we love him a little while longer. And we, we let our heart fall in love with the spirit of the Lord. Let me tell you this and then I got something that we're, we're, we're going to do. Daniel Kalinda said this. He said, our seeking of the Lord is in exact proportion to our value of him. He goes on to say, and this just this really convicted me. He said, if you were offered one million dollars, one million dollars for real, somebody had the money, they're infinitely wealthy, they've got the money. They said, hey, to everybody in this room, I'm going to give you a million dollars to make a two-hour window every day to just sit alone with God, enter into stillness, adore him, and linger there. For two hours, I'll give you a million dollars to just make a two-hour window every day. You can have the money if you'll do it every day. 
And many people would find a way to do that simply because the value of the money is so great. But if we value the Lord, our God, as the reward of seeking him, that he is the reward, that am I not more to you than a million dollars? If we value the Lord as our reward, we will eliminate from our lives whatever we have to in order to simply lay our head upon his chest and listen to the beat of his heart. Hear his voice today as he says to you, am I not more to you? He's worthy of it all. He's worthy of your heart. He's worthy of your time. He's worthy of your affections. He's worthy of your adoration. So here's what I want to do. If you'll just give me 10 minutes, it'll just take 10 minutes. And I'm going to do this and I'm not going to like add a benediction or anything after that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this, and then I'm going to take my seat. And I want, and I'm going to do it, and I want you to do this. We're going to enter into stillness and adore him and linger there for just 10 minutes. David in Psalm 25 and verse 1 said, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul meaning you're going to lift up your, your mind, all those thoughts that are going to try to push in, you're going to just bring them to him. I have a song that a young man is going to play in just a minute, not, not just one second. He'll, 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 he'll turn on this music for me. And here's what's going to happen. I want you to let the music wash over you. I want you to enter into stillness as you worship the Lord. And, and the first part of the song is going to be your heart's cry to the Lord. Let it be your confession as you enter into stillness and just adore him. And then you'll notice a shift in the music where the Lord will begin to sing to you. And he'll respond to you. He'll, res he'll sing back in response to your love. Let him do that. And then the music will shift, and it's almost as if you can't discern if it's him singing to you or you singing to him. Just let it wash over you. And then it'll take you back to where we started. Essentially, you want the, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit to be with you all. And so your prayer in this moment will be, take my heart, take my whole life too. Because God knows I need to fall in love with you. Will you start that music for me? Thank you. Take my heart. Take my whole life too. Because I can't help falling in love with you. Yes. Take my whole life to get still see him cause I can't help falling in love with you yes My son, 
my son why are you striving you can't add one thing to what's been done for you I did it all while I was dying thank you Jesus rest in your faith my peace will come to you yes God when I hear the praises start I want to rain upon you blessings that will fill your heart I see no stain on you thank you Jesus cause you are my child and you know me to me you're only holy yes nothing you've done remains only what you do for me just let me see your face let me just hear your voice let me see the one i love so near thank you let me see your face let me just hear your voice let me see the one Your presence is so real Here inside my heart Your presence is so real Yes Here inside my heart So I will lift my hands I will worship you I will lift my hands To adore you Worthy are you, Lord. Worthy are you, Lord. Worthy are you, Lord. Yes, God. Your presence is so real. Here inside my heart Your presence is so real
here inside my heart.